quasi-mythical figure born Yeshua ben Yosef was a carpenter in Bronze Age Palestine, he has since become one of the most significant figures in human history. After proclaiming himself to be the Son of God and also God incarnate, he received the title of Christ, meaning Saviour. Whilst we may fairly reject his claims to divinity, many hastily assume, okay, he wasn't divine, but so many people follow him. He must be a good moral teacher. But this is a mistake which panders to the Christian majority in an attempt to limit the offence caused. It is to say, I don't agree with what you believe, but there must be good reasons for admiring and revering the man. But was Jesus really a good moral teacher, or is this just some social nicety we say to avoid conflict? Does Jesus truly deserve our respect? Before we begin, however, let's be sure to judge him on the best moral standards we can think of. It isn't enough to judge him on the standards of his time. He may well have been an advanced moral teacher in his day, but that has little standing now. So when we're talking about what Yeshua ben Yosef taught, we're comparing his teachings to the teachings of all those great moral thinkers who came after him and those who came long before. His moral contributions are not original and his original contributions are not moral. Let us clear away the misapprehension that do unto others as you would have them do unto you is a novel preaching of the Nazarene. In fact, this sentiment, known as the ethic of reciprocity, can be found in historical texts that predate the Christ by a millennia. As a general rule, it isn't bad, but there are certainly exceptions. Surely we wouldn't want a sadomasochist following this preachment. Now, Yeshua ben Yosef made three significant moral contributions. The first is non-resistance of evil and passivity. Speaking on the mount, he says, I say unto you, that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. That is, don't resist evil. If someone hurts you, allow them to hurt you again. This is a preposterous moral preachment, and one that paves the ground for the most grotesque violations of human sanctity. When the Jewish people were being ruthlessly exterminated under the Nazi regime, who would have had the audacity to say, turn the other cheek? The most moral action is to defend the lives of those who cannot defend themselves. We shouldn't resist not evil, as the Nazarene would have us do. Underpinning this talk is the second contribution, the idea that the Christ can forgive evil actions. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. An ordinary man who said these things would not be a moral man, but would be considered a monster. Imagine that you are violently assaulted by a pair of thugs, during which they delight in causing you misery. You would have good reason to wish justice, but justice has no meaning in a world where the thugs feel no guilt. For the thugs believe that the Christ forgives all sins. Forgiveness is a necessity for feelings of guilt to go away, but they do not need your forgiveness. They do not offer you an apology. Yeshua ben Yosef has told them that he has already forgiven them, that they are cleansed of all unrighteousness. And remember that we are assessing his teachings as if he were merely a man. A second example. Imagine if a judge were to forgive and pardon a convicted rapist for his crimes against a young girl. Even if the rapist claims to, and really does, regret his actions, what right would the judge have to forgive the rapist on the girl's behalf? It is the girl's place to forgive, or to not, as she chooses, and it must ultimately be her decision in seeking peace of mind. Forgiveness can only be granted by those wronged, and the preaching of the Nazarene is vile in suggesting otherwise. The promise of forgiveness for one's crimes, any crimes, should seem immediately jarring. Imagine if the president of BP was a Christian, and he felt unaffected by criticism over the Deepwater Horizon spill because he thought he'd been forgiven by the only person who really mattered. No crime is too grotesque for Jesus. The third moral contribution is that you should love your neighbour as yourself. Yeshua ben Yosef considered this his second most important teaching. The first being the creepy commandment to love him more than anybody else. 
This narcissistic injunction to love one's neighbor suggests a bizarre thing, that you should love indiscriminately, love everyone. This is a marvelous way to brutalize the notion of love. Love is what we feel for that which we regard highest. We feel it only for those who are most special and most meaningful in our lives. The brute fact is that not everyone deserves your love. But the Nazarene, in these five words, degrades love, asking you to award it to every person you know, be they selfless charity worker or serial sex offender. Alternatively, he presents a conundrum to the self-loathing. For anyone unfortunate enough to hate him or herself, Yeshua ben Yosef asks that they extend that hatred to everybody else. If Jesus was God, he was, at best, incompetent. Even if we grant that the Christ was truly divine and truly real, he still falls short of anything we would call moral. It can be said that anyone is guilty of the good they do not do. If I can save a life with no cost to myself, but I don't, my actions are justifiably frowned upon. If I know something terrible is about to happen, but I give no warnings, I should have to live with my conscience forever after for all of the harm I might have prevented. If Jesus Christ was God incarnate, he was an abysmal underachiever. We now know that infections are caused by microorganisms, not demons. If the Nazarene had had a moral bone in his body, he would have taught us of antibiotics, painkillers and anaesthetics in the first century. Imagine the immediate improvement to the quality of life that would have resulted. Imagine all those for 2,000 years whose suffering could have been alleviated. But he didn't. We now know that sexual urges are entirely natural, ethically pure when consensual, and fun to fulfill. The Nazarene could have explained that the primitive religious notions of strict gender roles, strict heterosexuality, and strict monogamy were unnecessary, restrictive, and wrong. Imagine the liberation that was so hard fought for in the 19th and 20th centuries having been brought to us two millennia earlier. Imagine how he could have preached against homophobia, against rape, against misogyny, but he didn't. Imagine what a benevolent, all-knowing saviour might truly have been able to do for the human race. Imagine the utopia that might have been begun by a being that knew all there is to know, the happiness that might have been. Every 3.6 seconds, someone dies of starvation. How easy it would have been for an omnipotent being to rectify such colossal wrongs. But he didn't. What did the all-knowing, all-powerful God incarnate do? He sent himself to an illiterate part of what is now Palestine and knowingly had himself murdered in order to erase from mankind a curse that came about because he wasn't paying attention to the only two humans he'd so far created. The comedy of Jesus' death is in the inconsistency of contemporary Christian teaching. They say that he died for our sins as a grand gesture of his love and that the heroic act was the ultimate sacrifice. Now, this would have had more force if Yeshua ben Yosef truly was just a man, but when men die, they are permanently dead. The death of Christ, if he were truly God, would be no kind of death, since he would always be fully aware of his capacity to live again. When an ordinary person sacrifices their life to protect another from harm, and so long as they harm no others in that act, they are committing a noble deed. When the Christ does it, it is empty, for his mortal life is just one stage before the next life. We brief mortals have no such luxuries, and to consider the moral equivalence is to degrade the act of altruism that self-sacrifice can be. The Fact of Mortality Considering him once more as merely a man, Yeshua ben Yosef is quoted in John saying, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Quite a claim from the Palestinian blacksmith. We are only mammals and remain only partially rational. As such, we're afraid of the dark, we're afraid of the unknown, and we're afraid to die. The thought of evading death and achieving immortality is a recurring theme throughout human history. 
but it is only fiction. However comforting it may be for the old or the infirm, it simply isn't true, and that is important. Imagine you are a doctor, and a close friend has just stepped into your office to hear the results of their cancer screening. You read through the results, and to your dismay, you discover that they have a very aggressive and advanced tumour that will be fatal within months. Imagine that your friend has a family, a job, retirement plans, a happy life. The news will be life-shattering. You now have two choices. The first choice. You tell them the truth. They are going to die soon. They weep and despair and go into the arms of their loved ones and live the rest of their brief existence on their own terms. They can do the things that they had always wanted to do. The things a life of commitments had never let them do. They might realize for the first time the value and brevity of this life and the air never tastes better. Your news is not comforting. They do not want it, but it is true. The second choice. You don't tell them the truth. You tell them what is comforting, what they want to hear. You tell them that they don't have cancer, that they are free to live a happy and full life. They celebrate and go back to their life, but it isn't true. They return to the world of work, stress and living, but their condition deteriorates and they feel it only too late. They realize that you lied to them. You can only imagine their fury. You took from them the most precious time of their life, their final days of health. They did not live out their days on their terms as they would have wanted. So then, comfort or truth? The fact of mortality is a fact we must reconcile ourselves with, however uncomfortable we may find it. To lie and say that death will never come is inexcusable. Jesus is offering the false promise of immortality and all those terrified of death flock to him. But there the analogy breaks down because all those who lived out their lives in obedience and prostration to God in the hopes of a second life, all those so afraid of death that they do not freely live, they never get the chance to express their fury at those who lied to them. They die comforted, yet deceived. They have been robbed of the only brief existence that their consciousness will ever know, and in the vain hopes of another. Humanism is the philosophy that stands in direct opposition to this cruel fable. The humanist knows that they have one life, a short, insignificant, beautiful life, and one that is not to be wasted placating non-existent entities. In this way, Jesus is the greatest enemy of humanism. Consider carefully then the line between what is comforting to believe and what is true. The legacy of Jesus. Finally, we come to the teaching of Yeshua ben Yosef that has impacted most on the imagination of humanity, the threat of eternal torture after death. Nowhere in the Old Testament is it said that the dead could be punished. The word hell, translated from the Hebrew Sheol, refers only to a realm of the dead, thought to be literally under the ground. Not until the great moral teacher, gentle Jesus, meek and mild, is it said that you will be eternally tortured if you do not live as he wishes you to live. In Matthew, Yeshua says that angels will, quote, gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. And later, he is quoted as saying, If thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life halt or maimed, rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. This is the man that the good book is about. But we unbelievers may easily shrug off the threat of hell. For us, it is the equivalent of some New Age hippie threatening to punch us in the aura. We aren't afraid of it because we don't believe it exists. But for hundreds of years, hell was a very real place in the minds of believers. 
who thought that their eternal souls were at real risk of eternal torture unless they obediently adhered to the teachings of the church. This fear is not extinct. Even today, with modern medicine and scientific research, whilst we are learning about extrasolar planets and quantum physics, there are still those terrified of punishment beyond the grave, thanks to the Messiah. So then, on top of the threat of eternal torture, Yeshua ben Yosef teaches non-resistance of evil, he forgives wrongdoers without the consent of the victim, he lies to those most afraid of death, and he devalues love. And if he were truly God, he is guilty of the most shameful underachieving. He murdered himself to atone for his own idiocy. He posters a great sacrifice whilst being fully aware of his own immortality. And on top of this, and worst of all, he then considers himself worthy of your love. It is often joked that if Jesus were to come back today, we'd probably lock him up. The irony is that if we did, we'd be justified.